All right, so so a lot of our students, uh, both Ant and my students, have been asking us um, about what we think about the non-indictment uh, of officer or former officer Darren Wilson in regards to the shooting of Michael Brown and and people have been using words and uh, like you know police terrorism police uh, uh, police state and things like that and so you know and, and just to frame this for for folks like to to really understand what happened with the grand jury and why people can be so upset about this particular aspect. There's a plenty of things to be upset about in all through the evidence and how things were handled and whatnot, but on this particular space, in regards to the grand jury, what I want people to understand is that with grand juries, that they only have to determine probable cause in regards to being able to send something forward into a, for a, a legal battle, if you would, uh, and whatnot. Just probable cause, which is a way lower standard, a way lower standard than reasonable doubt, okay? So what, what I'm trying to tell you is that that it shouldn't it should be a no brainer to send this to the court. It should be a no brainer. And as a matter of fact, like like ninety nine over ninety nine percent of all other grand jury uh, 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 grand juries choose to indict folks when they're not police officers. However, police officers are very rarely, if ever, indicted by grand juries. And yo, know, and, and when you think about this. What, what you're seeing is a lack of consistency, right? And that you're seeing a privileged space and whatnot for police officers to carry out what we clearly saw with Eric Gardner and with uh, these other spaces, uh, with the, the killing of the 12 year old in, in you know, the, with Cleveland. the BB gun uh, in, in Cleveland, and then the kid in Walmart who got shot and killed. It's like what you clearly see on those videos, and the only reason why I don't say Michael Brown right now is because there wasn't a video. What you clearly see is what I would consider excessive police, uh, excessive use of force if nothing else, uh, and whatnot. And yet, at the same time, and especially with Eric Gardner, which the chokehold was illegal, um, and, and this was actually caught on videotape, and the, the situation, I would argue, it was not even life-threatening, and so why did this have to go down the way that it is? And the, not only that, but the freaking, I, I want to say the coroner's office or whoever legal person, yeah. they even declared that this was a homicide, right. and yet they still got off. Right. And, so, and so when you see just simply that the grand jury is there is probable cause. That's it. That, that's probable cause. It's like, oh, could it happen? Yes. That, that should have sent it forward to, that should have sent it forward. But it very rarely, if ever, gets sent forward when it involves police officers. However, like over 99% of, of, of grand juries indict people when they're not police officers. And that, all by itself, should let you know something about this kind of state that we live in, whether that be police or not. And what you're talking about is institutional racism, right? Which Absolutely. is, I think, the concept we're always trying to push, at least when I'm teaching intro to sociology or, right, or race right. studies, right? This idea of institutional discrimination. But for me, what I'm always interested and fascinated by is not just the institutional discrimination, but the relationship that attitudes play into the institutional discrimination. Mm. We're accustomed to thinking about racism, not even institutionally, really. We're accustomed to thinking about racism in the old ideological, okay, black people are inferior, white mm -hmm. people are superior. Keep looking for racists. Keep looking for yeah. racists, right? Individual racists. Um, and sort of, and, and institutional allows us to sort of hide that and we get, you know, the conversations of colorblind racism. But one of the things that often gets left out, but is a part of each one of these things is attitudes and perceptions about whatever person of color group this is, right? In right. our case, we're looking at black people. Um, and you'll hear me say the term black bodies all the time. So we're looking at attitudes toward black bodies. Absolutely. In our society, when we had policing of black bodies in the 50s and 60s in Los Angeles, right, we know that these were racist police brought in to police black bodies. And so yeah. you get all of these police terrorists um, and the terrorist state. Or and you talk about New York as recently as 1980s and 90s, right? Mayor yeah. Giuliani is policing black bodies right. on the basis of cleaning up the streets. These are right. very, very specific acts targeting specific groups, black Puerto Ricans, etc. But when we look at policing now, a lot of it is based off the attitudes that these police officers have toward black bodies that are not brought in intentionally to discriminate against right. black bodies, right, to right. police these black bodies, but the attitudes coming from film, coming from television, coming from the, the idea that we feel so much more connected because we all are listening to Top 40 Radio and there's a rapper on there. Yeah. We all are seeing images of the ghetto, but we actually have less and less interaction with each other, yet this 
this feeling of more and more familiarity, which is extremely problematic because it, you know, my friend uh, wrote, wrote an amazing poem in which he says, black bodies are always treated like problems before anything else, including humanity. Right. 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 And uh, there's some amazing things that um, statistics that you look at where white folks think black people make up 30 percent of the population. <laughs> Yeah. We're 14, 14 -ish, uh, or yeah. 16 if you count the half-breeds, that's us. <laughs> that and be. so the attitudes that we have about black bodies are, are if we're always represented as problematic, if we're always represented right. as a, a problem or dysfunctional or as criminals, and the positive images of black people are so small, so insignificant. Right. Even if we're overrepresented in commercials, it's for Walmart, it's for cheaper brands, right. not right. luxury things. Exactly. Then the attitudes that police have are actually reflections of attitudes that all white thinking people have right. Right. about black bodies. And so these things feed right into the institutional structure, the courtroom work groups that we get these non-indictment verdicts from. Yeah, you know, and just wrapping that up to say, you know, that when you when you introduce this idea of racism, a lot of people continue to think that you need to quote have racists in order to have racism, and what you know Ann is talking about, and what we continue to talk about is that I don't know if Officer Darren Wilson ever used the word nigger in his life. I don't honestly, I don't care. All I know is that the way that black bodies get treated in the media, the way that we so are socialized in black to, 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 to treat black people um, and whatnot, that is the thing that individuals, they can't do really anything about because that's what they get socialized into. And so that part is the part that we are continuing to bring up. And so when, when people, when white thinking people continue to say, well, this can't be about race because, you know, Officer Darren Wilson never used the word nigger or he didn't imply anything. It's like, yo, it's completely about race, but it's not that we're, that we're saying that he's a racist. I don't know that. I honestly, I just don't know that. However, I do know that racism, act, institutional racism, acts on our bodies in a way that justifies the violence against it, especially by police officers.